You guys may be quite aware that I am not really a fan of a lot of what current electric car makers are doing, aside from Tesla. And it all stems to one fundamental important part of the electric car, the charging. There's the charging infrastructure that I've been ranting about for quite a long time. And then there's also the fact that uh, a lot of automakers, excluding Tesla, though Tesla was guilty of this, they'd offer free unlimited charging for three years, which is also not the most brilliant idea ever. Uh, the things they do just drive me nuts. But there's one last thing to the whole fundamental piece of charging that basically everyone except two different automakers so far, only these two have figured out the whole thing, the charge connector design. Everyone except Tesla and Aptera, although yes, Aptera may not be out just yet. Everyone except Tesla and Aptera is basically using such a poorly designed charge part just because, well, when need a charge port. Hmm, which one are we going to use? Are we going to use one that's future-proof so if we design a vehicle that can take advantage of it, we don't have to worry about switching connectors or anything. Oh, also it's small and compact and actually can be very well secured into the car. Or are we going to just use this half-baked idea design charge port? Yeah, you get the point. CCS is terrible and today I am going to actually go into detail and explain to you why CCS is terrible. Warning, this is going to be a long video. Okay, I've tried to film this video so many times and I realized, you know what? I'm not gonna be able to make a short video out of this. So this is gonna be a long video. Chapter markers are gonna be there to help you sift through this. Yeah, allow me to explain to you why CCS is fundamentally a terrible design and everyone should be straying away from it. Like don't even buy CCS cars. All right, let's begin. <laughs> So to talk about um, CCS's poor design, I have to talk a little bit about the history of it. And there's actually two separate ports baked into CCS. So there's two separate histories I have to talk about. Let's just talk about how this whole connector was designed in the first place. Starting in 2001, when plug-in hybrids were evidently starting to become a popular thing, I guess, SAE, the same company that also standardizes our engine oil types, like for example, the engine oil that Red Fox takes in particular is SAE, 5W30 standard. So SAE is actually the one who's responsible for developing this standard. SAE J1772 it was originally designed for plug-in hybrids and okay, I guess some fully electric vehicles have decided to use that because uh, at the time onboard chargers were more popular than offboard public charging stations. So due to that, it was only reasonable to design a connector that only needed to provide enough power for the most powerful onboard chargers. Now, if I sound like I'm confusing you already, then let me explain to you what exactly an onboard charger is. The onboard charger is basically a box that is inside the vehicle that converts the AC power that you get from the wall to the DC power that your battery actually likes. Because I don't know if you know this, but AC and DC, they don't mix well. So you have to convert it in order to be able to use it. And basically every single electric vehicle, I don't know a single one that does not have this use case scenario, but basically every electric vehicle has an onboard charger. For a little demonstration here, we're gonna focus on a bit small scale and just realized that electric cars are on a much larger scale. But this right here is the charging brick for my Dell XPS. Basically, if we take a look at this, we have the standard uh, NEMA connector that plugs into our household outlets. Yes, everyone, this actually is a NEMA connector, believe it or not. You get the standard NEMA connector that plugs into your household outlets, which means you're getting AC power going through this cord. Then that AC power flows through this little brick right here. That's when it gets converted to DC power. And then that DC power that was just converted from the brick flows through this cable to our laptops. So if we convert this to uh, how a charger works in a car per se, well, okay. I wish I actually had a better example to, to show you exactly how it works. So with electric cars and plug-in hybrids, the AC to DC converter box, that thing is actually located inside the car because this may be a 130 watt AC to DC converter. However, most onboard chargers within electric cars are much larger than this, therefore also much heavier than this. So that's why they're not typically external of the car. They're actually just located inside of it. That and well, if you want to charge on the go, like I mean, you, you're talk, we're talking about a car here, which means you're not staying in the same place. It's just be easier to leave that charger in the car. So you typically don't see it. But the giant box that you see at the end of our computer charging cables, this box right here, yep, uh, that's located inside the car. You just don't see it because it's in the car. So the basic way power flows to your battery in an electric car is you have first your NEMA connector on the end of your EVSC, which stands for electric vehicle supply equipment. Some people call it the electric vehicle vehicle 
service equipment, but I think supply does a better job at describing what it does because it's not really servicing the car. It's just supplying the car with electricity. To me, grammatically, electric vehicle supply equipment makes more sense. And that is how most people on the internet describe it, including Energy Star themselves. Yes, when Energy Star describes what EVSE means, they use the term electric vehicle supply equipment. So some call it electric vehicle service equipment. I don't like that term. I use supply equipment. But essentially you have a cable with a little box called the EVSC, which is basically a little thing that tells your car, hey, don't pull this many amps, otherwise you'll trip the breaker. And also it does a few other safety things, but that will typically be found in the AC end of the cable. So obviously with a demonstration I have here today, that is not how it's going to work. But basically you plug your NEMA connector into the wall. That power flows from the NEMA connector to the EVSC, which has a few other smarts that tell the car, hey, don't pull this many amps, otherwise you'll trip the breaker and safety stuff. Then after that, it goes to the very end of the J1772 connector. And that J1772 connector goes into the car, which goes to the onboard charger. And then after that gets converted, it goes basically to the battery. Okay, so yeah, that's a lot of garbly gook that I probably didn't need to explain. And I already explained this in my AC charging video, but I figured it's worth re-mentioning. But why am I mentioning this? Why am I mentioning onboard chargers and such and the J1772 connector? What does this have to do with um, CCS's bad design? Well, allow me to explain. Due to the fact that electric vehicles have an onboard charger, that means it has to fit somewhere in the car. And due to the fact that it has to fit somewhere in the car, that means it can only be so big, therefore so powerful. The most powerful onboard chargers you'll find in electric vehicles today is roughly 80 amps of intake, which converts to a just under 20 kilowatts of power. Most vehicles won't take 80 amps, they'll take maybe like 48 amps or some even less. But the most powerful onboard charger you'll find today is an 80 amp onboard charger, which you'll not really find all that often. You'll find it in like the F-150 Lightning. But the point is, it's only so powerful. And when J1772 was actually being standardized, it only needed to be powerful enough to supply that 80 amp onboard charger 80 amps. So because of that, SAE J1772, the AC connector that you're all familiar with for non-Tesla EVs, yeah, that is only powerful enough to service the most powerful onboard charger that you'll find in electric cars today. However, 80 amps or 20 kilowatts? We all know that today's electric vehicles can charge much faster than that. But how do they charge that fast if J1772 can only give your car 20 kilowatts? Well, let's now talk about the rest of CCS because CCS is actually a DC charging standard, not an AC charging standard, believe it or not. So at the time, uh, this was basically how you charge your car. You basically slow charged it at home. And yeah, it was not convenient for road trips. And that is kind of how the electric vehicle got its unfortunate stigma of being the city daily driver car, unfortunately. That is until Tesla came along and Tesla redefined the electric vehicle. When Tesla came out with the Model S, I know they came out with the Roadster first, guys, but the Roadster was not as significant as the Model S release, in my opinion. When Tesla came out with the Model S, of course, had an 80 amp onboard charger, but also um, that wasn't the only way to charge it. Tesla knew that electric vehicles at this point were basically referred to as city daily driver cars because uh, in order to charge them, you basically had to wait for it to charge overnight to get all of your range back. And you just couldn't take it that far due to lithium ion battery chemistries not being exactly that advanced at the time. But with the Model S, Tesla completely changed that. Not only can the Model S actually go pretty far on a single charge, but they also did something crazy when it came to charging the Model S as well. Now, DC charging was not a new concept. The Nissan Leaf had already started the DC charging concept with Chatamo, though Chatamo was limited to 50 kilowatts, which made it still only uh, fast enough for city fast charging use, not really a uh, long distance road tripping use. Tesla, on the other hand, they introduced their proprietary at the time, Tesla connector, now referred to as NAX today because it is now a public standard, but at the time it was proprietary. This connector basically had the same fundamentals as J1772, except they changed a little something with the power pins that J1772 is not capable of. You may have noticed if you take a look at a J1772 connector next to Tesla's connector, the power pins on the Tesla connector are absolutely massive compared to the power pins on the J1772 connector. That's because the power pins on the J1772 connector were designed to only be able to AC power an onboard charger, which was 20 kilowatts at most. But the power pins on Tesla's connector are much more massive, which means you can shove a lot more power through that thing. In fact, even more power than what CCS today is even capable of. Because of that, Tesla could get much better charging speeds and make the cars actually that much more road trippable. Now at the time, yeah, it was 
early days electric cars and it was still a little hard to road trip even a Model S because Tesla was still getting their supercharger network off the ground and they only had like a few superchargers in existence. But for the most part, they designed the first long distance electric vehicle that we can actually take on road trips. And in part, their charging connector allowed much faster recharge speeds so that way we weren't stuck charging at ridiculously slow speeds even though, okay, yeah, early days for Tesla, it was still roughly an hour due to the fact that the most powerful supercharger at the time was their version one with a uh, hundred kilowatts of output. My apologies guys in the last video where I described V1 superchargers as the urban superchargers. Apparently those were something different. It's just I've never actually seen a version one supercharger and I'm willing to bet it's because that infrastructure has been getting ripped out of the ground. I've been searching plug share everywhere to see if I can find a V1 supercharger anywhere, but I could never find a V1 supercharger anywhere. And for the most part, uh, because urban superchargers are half speed of V2 superchargers, I just assumed that the urban superchargers were V1. So my apologies in the last video, everyone. Again, because we don't see V1 superchargers today anymore, how should I know? But at the time, Tesla basically had designed a connector that was more powerful and therefore could get electric cars back on the road that much faster. So this was a problem for non-Tesla EVs. You basically couldn't road trip to long distances because you were charging way too slow. And I assume that eventually SAE realized, hmm, this is a problem. We can't get electric cars to go long distance because they take too long to charge. Nobody's gonna wanna wait like four or five hours for the thing to fully charge. So they took their existing design, which was the AC connector, because I mean, for AC charging guys, the connector still works in terms of power output. There's actually no problems with power output with um, the J1772 connector. Oh, there's other flaws that I'll get to in a minute. But they did realize that with that design, they couldn't even copy Tesla's approach of using the same Tesla connector for not only AC charging, but for DC charging. Because uh, due to J1772's connector design, the power pins are way too small to be able to output the kind of power required for DC charging an electric car. So what is their solution? They basically tacked on an extra pill of DC pins. Yep, that's their solution. You may have noticed on the CCS connector, there's two pins at the bottom, and those are the DC pins that are capable of much higher power transfer compared to the AC pins on the J1772 connector. So yeah, if you always wonder why it looks like uh, the DC pins were just tacked on at a later point, it's because they literally were. They were actually a complete afterthought. So there's the history of it explaining its design. And yeah, th that's basically <laughs> just showing you how a lot of the features of this connector were basically designed. A lot of it was a complete afterthought, including the DC pins. Those were complete afterthought. So, all right, let's talk about the rest of the design of this connector that's actually very flawed. So I'm going to first start off with the DC pins themselves. The AC pins, I actually do not have a problem with. The J1772 connector's power delivery is fine. There's other problems that I have with that connector though that we'll get to in a second, but I want to first address the DC pins in the specification. A lot of people th seem to think that CCS is fairly future-proof because on Electrify America's 350 kilowatt chargers, well, that's 350 kilowatts, which is faster than what Teslas can charge at today. And there are only like two electric cars that I'm aware of that can actually charge at 350 kilowatts. Those being the Lucid Air and the Hummer EV. So while some people might want to say it's pretty future-proof, honestly, I beg to differ. 350 kilowatts is more than what a lot of EVs are charging at today, but there's a slight problem with that. To achieve the 350 kilowatts that are available at the DC chargers, you need to have an 800 volt EV architecture. And there are not a lot of 800 volt EVs out there. Like, let me list a few. Hyundai's eGMP platform, so that includes their three SUVs with their upcoming Ionic 6. Lucid Air, Porsche Taycan. I'm actually kind of blanking on other 800 volt class EVs at the moment. Even though the Hummer EV actually is capable of charging at 350 kilowatts, it's because they have a massive battery, so that way they can actually accept that. That and they have some crazy technology to actually boost the voltage of the entire battery pack to be able to pull that much. But for the most part, in terms of general operation, Hummer EV's battery pack is actually a very low voltage, believe it or not. It's actually below 400 volts, which only goes to explain its lack of efficiency <laughs> even more. So what's the problem with it? Why is it only the 800 volt EVs can actually get 350 kilowatts? It's because of CCS's 500 amp limitation. It is a huge problem. And this is why I think Volvo with their EX90, they're advertising they're going to hit 250 kilowatts with a 400 volt battery pack. In order to get that, especially at low states of charge, the battery voltage is even lower than what it's typically advertised at. So because of that, you're going to need to dump at least 600 amps or a little more than 600 amps 
and CCS? Uh-uh, we can't do 600 amps. That's not what the standard allows for. While some might say, but there have been electric cars that have charged at above 600 amps with CCS. True, but there's also been a lot of stories where the connectors themselves have actually melted because of repetitive above 500 amp charging use. Because of that, I think it's pretty clear that that standard is not capable of above 500 amps. Even if you can do it for a short period, it's not capable of doing it repetitively. And that has resulted in, I kid you not, melted charge ports. And oh, those are fun to get out. So yeah, the DC pins were a complete afterthought and Nax is more capable anyways. Just wanted to point that out. But other problems with CCS that I have, and this is more specifically with the type one connector. The type two connector has actually addressed this. So people in Europe, your CCS connector, you don't even have to pay attention to what I'm saying. You can skip to the next chapter. But for anyone who's here in North America, we're stuck with a type one connector. Uh, we got to talk about this very flawed design. With this design, the connector actually locks onto the car. And so the car locking onto the connector. Again, CCS type two does not have the problem. With the type two connectors design, the car actually locks onto the connector. And this is good. Why? It's because here in North America, we happen to have a lot of assholes that like to just walk up to your car and unplug it because, oh, it's cool. What is wrong with people today? That is a problem with the Type 1 connector, specifically J1772. With the CCS connector, when it comes to DC charging, automakers have actually had to put in a little pin that actually locks onto the locking pin on the connector. And that's because you do not want that thing to unplug when you got 350 kilowatts surging through that thing, because otherwise you will definitely cause an arc flash and if not kill yourself, then seriously injure yourself. With the DC connector, they actually had to design the locking pin to have a separate pin compress a against it. But with the J1772 connector, the way you actually stop charging is you actually just unplug it like you do the next connector. Now you might be thinking, well, why not just use that pin that pushes down on the pin in the CCS connector? Why not just push that down on the J1772 handle? It's because the locking pin on the J1772 handle, it's not designed to have something pushed on it. Quite often those pins on the AC connector are made of plastic. Those locking pins are made of plastic, not metal. While in the CCS connector, I have yet to see a locking pin that's actually made of plastic. So if the car were actually to place its locking pin on top of the handles locking pin, yeah, it is so difficult to say that because uh, it's such a bad design. If the car's locking pin were to be compressed against the locking pin on the handle, most likely it will break. So with CCS Type 2's design, as well as the NAX connector's design, um, the car locks onto the connector instead of the connector locking onto the car. Therefore, you can lock the car and the car will basically not let go of the connector until you unlock the car. Therefore, no random yahoos can come up and unplug your car just because, oh, they think it's cool. Guys, it is not. Why do you people think acting like a jerk makes you cool all of a sudden? It does not. But yeah, that's another fundamental problem with it. Again, when you're DC charging with the CCS Type 1, there is a pin that actually pushes against the locking pin on the handle to make sure that does not get unplugged. But there's a problem with even that design in itself that Kyle Connor had discovered. On his trip, he had to charge twice with his Rivian because he was towing. And Rivian uses CCS Type 1, obviously. He first pulled up to the Lakewood Supercharger where there was only one stall actually available to charge his car at the time. But here's the problem. That one stall of that he was charging on, the locking pin on the handle was damaged. Therefore, the car's locking pin that locks onto the locking pin of the handle. Oh my goodness, I hate this so much. Who designed this thing? Yeah, the car actually can't hold on to the handle anyways. Without the handle's locking pin, that connector's not secure. Even if the car activates its locking pin, that typically locks the locking pin on the handle. Ugh, this is so hard to explain. Basically what I'm saying is the car can't hold on to the connector. So that means while, say, the Rivian's case, 200 kilowatts, while 200 kilowatts is surging through that connector, anyone can actually walk up and unplug that while it's charging, causing an arc flash, which if it doesn't kill them, it'll at least very badly injure them and hospitalization will be required. You join me here in Lakewood, Colorado for a rate your charge update and things are not looking good, friends. I am sorry to report that only half the chargers seem to be in good working order as it seems to always go, unfortunately. Those two on the end, working great. The one the Maki is plugged into, working great. This one is completely unavailable, charger unavailable. And the reason it's unavailable, I'm assuming, is because the DC pin on this 
Huber Schooner cables just screwed. Now the nice thing is it looks like this plastic piece is user serviceable, or I should say technician serviceable, so that hopefully won't cost them the many thousand dollars, thousands of dollars it is for this cable. Now we are technically charging on this unit, but we should not be. This is the only, these two stalls are the only ones I can actually get the Rivian to, of course, with the trailer not blocking any of the parking lot. I plugged in over here because, um, you know, it was available. I'll tell you why I didn't plug into that one in a second. And by the way, that was on the ground when I got here. I'm not gonna touch it. But the little retainer clip at the top is not functional. So anyone can just walk in and I, I'm not gonna do it, but you can pull the charger straight out and it will arc flash. And you know, you have 215 kilowatts, about 500 amps running through that cable. It's not latched to the vehicle at all. This charger should be marked as offline, number five super sketchy i'm not joking really sketchy anyone can just pull that thing and bam you get some serious power going now this one also claims available and good to go insane take a look at this this is how it got when i got here just laying on the ground the whole end of the charger is just completely missing i mean this is just awful actually look at this right here here's the uh the end of the connector i have no idea how it came missing because uh actually doesn't look damaged. So I guess worst case, I could have put it all back together and charged. According to this charger here, hey, you're good to go. That could really hurt if you plug it into the wrong one. So things are not looking good in Lakewood, Colorado. And what a true shame it really is. But that wasn't the only time he actually ran into that problem. Believe it or not, his next charging stop in Frisco had the exact same issue. Welcome here to a Rate Your Charge in Frisco, Colorado. I always like this stop at night because everyone's just asleep in their kitted out vans and we're going to let them be uh, asleep. But this is another super sketchy situation. I haven't tried all the other chargers. I know they're actually all online and working. I just stopped this charging session, but watch this. I'm not going to hit the button and I can pull the handle right out. You can see another failed latch right here, leading to potential of major damage, major arc flash. Again, 500 amps and over 400 volts flowing through here. You can pull this thing out faster if you trip on the cable, if you accidentally pull it, then the fault trips can actually cut the current from flowing. Super unbelievably sketchy. This cable should be listed as offline. This is unit number two, cable number one. I haven't tried all the others because it's almost one o'clock in the morning, but just absolutely insane. 100 kilowatt hours flown through it. I got the charge I wanted, but hey, I don't want to die today. They really need to fix these cable issues. And EA, you need to disable that cable from charging. That is way too sketchy. And it really could honestly seriously injure or kill someone if they trip on it and it arc flashes. It could definitely ruin your vehicle for sure. The only charger that he could charge on had a handle where there was no locking pin on it. The locking pin was broken off. Once again, if somebody pulled that out, it could have arc flash. And if it didn't kill them, seriously injured them to the point where hospitalization is required. Oh, meanwhile, Nax, um, yeah, the locking pin is controlled by the car and it's in the car and if it's broken then the car actually just doesn't even bother to start charging yeah i thought i'd point that out <laughs> another reason why the ccs connector is just poorly designed guys it's not the connector that should be holding on to the car it should be the car that's holding on to the connector for not only because you got random yahoos that want to unplug it but also if the locking pin on the connector breaks then driver's safety is really at risk and at that point the charger should just be flat out marked offline but of course how's the charger going to know it's a mechanical design and not an electrical design. And then my last complaints are just the fact that it's just too bulky and even CCS2 is guilty of this themselves. I don't know why I'd have to mention this, but having a bulkier design means it requires more materials and due to the fact that CCS requires not only two separate AC pins, but also two separate DC pins, which means unlike the NAX connector, there's a total of seven pins on the type one connector. And if you use the type two connector, then uh, you have a total of nine pins actually because of three phase. Because you have to add all of those extra pins it does not help keep the cost of that port down. And yeah, you gotta invest in more materials in terms of housing. Oh, and did I mention that this general connector's design is actually less durable than the design of NAX? I've seen some beat up NAX connectors in a lot of pictures, but most of the time when the cables are in rough shape, it's actually the cables themselves. Like the cables are ripped, not actually the connector being damaged to the point where it doesn't plug in. Even though, yeah, you'll find a lot of dents on NAX connectors, it still retains its shape to the point where you can 
still plug it in. Meanwhile, CCS, oh my goodness, you do not want to see those things take a beating because, oh, when they take a beating, they don't take it well. They are not durable connectors at all. And did I mention that uh, CCS connectors cost more to make compared to NAX connectors? Oh my goodness, there's so much wrong with this design. And the fact that this is the standard that automakers keep choosing, why? There are more 400 volt EVs out in the world today than 800 volt EVs. And yet you're basically limiting those 400 volt EVs to just a hair over 200 kilowatts because 500 amp limitation. We can't go above 500 amps because it's not safe to, and the connector will basically melt into the charge port if we basically continue to push more than 500 amps. The design's not actually, the term I've come up with is Karen proof, and it's because Karens are the most common people to do the type of stuff. It is very unsafe when that latching pin is broken because anyone can accidentally trip over it or unplug it and basically kill themselves because unsafe design. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about this is why is it actually designed this bad in the first place? Because at this point, I probably convinced you, yeah, it's bad. We should not be using this standard. But here's the kind of a final reason why we should not be using this. It's because when this was designed, at first, the AC connector was only designed for onboard chargers. And that's because, well, at the time, electric vehicles were not that common. Therefore, we didn't really need DC charging stations. So every electric car had their onboard chargers. And basically, the problem with this whole design is the people who designed it don't think EVs were going to be the future. They did not think electric vehicles would take off. Therefore, every single design of this connector was a complete afterthought. The AC connector worked extremely well aside from Karen's doing their horrible business to it. It worked really well back when there was very few electric cars and they were basically just city electric cars that you don't take on long distance road trips. It worked just fine for that aside from just no good Karens up to doing their thing. But once Tesla came around and showed everyone, this is how you make an electric car. And this is the reason why I'm still going to buy a Tesla over everyone else. They've shown everyone, this is how you make an electric car and they've done basically everything mechanically right. Now, yeah, there are other options out there that say have the 800 volt architecture, which is arguably more efficient than the 400 volt architecture. Though because Tesla likes to also associate themselves with performance, actually having a 400 volt architecture helps with that. But at the end of the day, Tesla still figured it out. The architecture is absolutely solid. The charging situation is completely figured out to the point where any Tesla owner basically doesn't have a problem charging the car. And it is ever rare. Like another thing I should point out, this isn't CCS's fault. This is just public charging fault. At a Tesla supercharger, we do not have to worry typically about whether we'll be able to charge there or not. The frequency of which a supercharger actually goes offline and we're stranded there is so low to the point where we don't have to worry about it basically. And if they do happen to get marked offline for whatever reason, Tesla always instantly sends engineers to get out there and well, get the station back online compared to other operators like EA, for example. But yeah, initially with J1772, it was designed with the thinking that electric cars were going to take off. So let's only design it for as powerful as we needed to. Then Tesla came around and oh, they really changed the definition of what an electric car can do. And because of that, other automakers were kind of interested in doing what Tesla was doing, but obviously there was no charging standard to allow them to do so. So then, okay, let's tack on two DC pins because uh, the AC pins were not capable enough. But again, this electric car still probably aren't going to take off. Oh, take a look at today's market, guys. Considering that governments are now banning the sales of gas cars and general sales of electric cars have even been improving to the point where everyone is struggling to get them out of the factory because they're trying to get the materials in and there's so much demand. Yeah, so because of the whole CCS being designed by people who thought electric cars weren't going to take off, something tells me this standard, along with its theory of electric cars are going to take off, this standard should go the same way as uh, everyone else's theory. This standard should not be taking off like it currently is today. So any automaker who wants to use this standard, do you really want to use a standard that is limiting the most cost-effective way of making an electric car, which is using the 400 volt architecture? Do you really want to limit them to slower charging speeds, less security when slow charging at home, a very risky situation when DC charging and that pin happens to be broken? And also, do you really want to choose a standard where the philosophy behind it is electric cars aren't going to take off? CCS's design is all based off of complete afterthoughts. So because of that, this is why I hate the standard so much. Technology Connections is really trying to push people to actually buy vehicles using J1772 and CCS. Even though he freely admitted that he does prefer Nax's design over CCS, but he argues that uh, CCS is basically future-proofed enough and because it is also the standard that most automakers have been picking in the first place. Well, I need to 
ask you this question, Alec. Considering Nax's posted specs today, and due to the fact that the CCS infrastructure is an absolute nightmare, as well as just it was poorly designed to begin with, do you really think CCS is that future-proofed? I don't blame them for being a little, I'll say, unaware of all of the major issues that are going on, because at least from what I've seen uh, when he's talking about the whole standard CCS, he hasn't seemed to have experienced the worst part of it because, hey, he's properly charging his electric car at home. Great job, because not enough people are charging their cars at home, especially when they can do it. But even when he happened to have taken that one road trip to Florida with aging wheels, he's mentioned this, apparently he hasn't really experienced the worst of Electrify America's problems. To my surprise, he actually had a smooth sailing experience at EA, which those are very rare. You have no idea, Alec, how rare it is to charge on Electrify America and have as seamless of an experience as you did. And to my knowledge, he's only done that one road trip. For the most part, he charges his car at home, which is how you're supposed to do it. Therefore, I don't think he sees the problem with a CCS's design. When it comes to charging in public settings, that's when it becomes an absolute major problem because now all of a sudden, your connector is exposed to the open and any Karen can just unplug the car as they want. CCS connectors can get very beaten, banged up. So yeah, it's not a durable design. It is very risky when that locking pin is damaged because if that connector gets accidentally unplugged, which it's not impossible, guys, especially when you strain the cables, which don't strain the cables. It is not impossible for those things to just slip out and cause an arc flash and either, if not kill you, then seriously hospitalize you. So to anyone who wants to push CCS as the better standard over NAX, what's your argument? Because I can't think of one. Every single design decision about it has been a complete afterthought. It is less capable than NAX. It's not exactly as easy for some people to hold like, there are actual people who struggle to maneuver a CCS handle. My sister tried it and she ended up having to use both hands to maneuver it because it's hard to maneuver CCS cables. So this is why I hate CCS and I'm surprised I actually didn't spiral off into a little overdrive like I typically do during my rants. But guys, we should not be supporting CCS, especially here in America. Europe, CCS, they're actually worse. And aside from, yeah, it's unfortunately a big and bulky design that Nax has handily taken care of. It does work there very well. And for the most part, a lot of the issues that I've had with it have been addressed. I have a feeling that there's a difference with this DC pins in CCS type two compared to type one, because Tesla seems to be able to continually push above 600 amps with CCS type two in Europe. And yet there's no ports melting in the charge port. Unlike CCS type one, where that seems to be a bit of a common issue. And so type two really does address a lot of my issues with it. But type one here in North America, we should not be using it. It is poorly designed. Nobody should be using CCS. And this is why I encourage you, do not buy a car with CCS. Unfortunately, that means I can only recommend you two different cars. One of them, which isn't even out yet. I can only recommend to you a Tesla or an Aptera. That is it. I cannot recommend CCS cars anymore because CCS is just a garbage tier standard. So if there's anything that I happen to have missed in explaining why CCS is such a terrible standard, feel free to let me know in the comments below. And if you really think that CCS is truly better than Nax, please feel free to explain your wrong opinions in the comments below so I can tell you why it is a wrong opinion because no matter how many ways you look at it, there is no advantage to using this connector. All right, enough rambling. Thank you for watching. Do me a favor and interact with the stuff below. My name is Alpha Two Wolf, Random Alpha, sending out.